Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we have started the event now, and we have gone live. Uh, so, Vikas, over to you now. Yeah, just give me a minute. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Um, a really warm welcome to all of the people who are attending Up to Grow. Thank you to Alliance for Integrity and GCN Network, especially India, who have given this opportunity to professionals across the world and talk about issues that are relevant to SMS, SME and MSME sectors, especially post-COVID scenarios and how businesses are coping. So uh, without uh, spending more time on uh, the uh, introductions, I would rather kind of introduce the participants. We have Ayush Ashwani Saxena. We have Ayatollah Jagun from Nigeria. We have Ashwani Saxena from India. And we have Thorsten, who has come from all the way from Bolivia. Thorsten is at the moment busy, so he'll join us a little later. So I'll start with you, Mr. Ashwani Saxena. And to introduce you, let me first read out from your exemplary track record. Just give me a minute here. With our homes becoming home offices, it is taking time for us to getting used to working on different locations of the home. Today I'm using a different location on my home because I was getting bored with the previous one. Having said that, Mr. Ashwini Satsena is a Chief Operations Officer at JSW Foundation and comes with more than 30 years of experience across India and Africa with reputed development organizations such as UNIDO, IFC, and corporates. He holds a master's degree in geology, business management, and CSR leadership from University of Geneva. He began as a geologist and did some important min mineral discoveries, but then moved on to rural development and became one of the first MSME cluster development specialists And um, MSMEC development, CSR sustainability programs across South Asia and Africa, and has championed IFC sustainability tools in South Asia. I would request if Mr. Ashwin Saxena, and the way I'm going to manage this panel is that I'm going to ask you for your opening statements, specifically catering towards looking at what do you think has post COVID? How and what has been the impact of COVID on MSME and SMEs and how are they coping with it? That's the opening remarks I would request from both Thorsten and Ayatollah as well. So starting with Ashwini, can you kind of walk us through that? Ashwini, you're on mute, we can't hear you. Okay, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, Vikas, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, and when I look at uh, SMEs, which have been the growth engines and you know the key employment providers, um, specifically to the context of India, I would say, uh, you'll see, uh, we will see that there's a mixed bag. You know, at some stages, there are a number of SMEs who are really struggling. But at the same time, if, if we look around, we'll also find a lot of innovation happening, uh, specifically by SMEs who, who have been more nimble-footed in uh, you know, responding back to the challenges being posed by COVID. And uh, if, if we, we may all just reflect back upon that, what we found is that under these challenging, distressing moments, uh, the products and the services which have been most important for us are largely by you know offered being being offered by SMEs, and that's where uh, you know your neighborhood mom and pop stores, uh, the uh, the innovative uh, I would say two wheeler led uh, food distribution networks, uh, the direct connect between farmers and you know the consumers in the cities. I think these are the kind of models which have come up very effectively to address the concerns and the issues and the challenges being faced by all of us as consumers as users of services and products. And I think this is this is the resilience of SMEs, you know, which which really gives me this hope that no matter what may happen, the SMEs would continue to play a significant role in our economies, and therefore it would be important for us to see how we can strengthen this whole thing further. 
Thank you so much. And Ayatollah is the Chief Compliance Officer and a Company Secretary to Onaro PLC. An experienced lawyer with 28 years of experience at bar, Ayatollah has spent most of her legal career in corporate practice, working across various jurisdictions, including the United Kingdom, Bermuda, and Nigeria. She has a master's in corporate governance and business ethics and is a fellow, governance, is a fellow of Governance Institute UK. Ayatollah has a passion for anti-corruption compliance and corporate governance. She was a co-chair of the 10th Principal Working Group of the United Nations Global Compact, New York, and is a board member of the Global Compact Network Nigeria and sits on the Nigeria Institute of Directors Committee of Independence Directors. She's a trustee of several NGOs and a director of SME operating in consultancy, agriculture, and faction sectors. Ayatollah speaks regularly on anti-corruption and corporate governance at local and international conferences and lectures on co compliance and risk at the Lagos Business School. Ayatollah is a council member of Nigerian Bar Association, Women's Forum, and currently holds, heads the NBAWF External Relations Committee. She also heads the Equality in Law, in Law, Focal Group of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group's Community of Practice and Gender. Ayatollah, having read that out, I'm feeling like a very small human being somewhere there. So we are actually waiting for you to speak, to kind of learn from your experience on MSMEs and SMEs. And what do you think are the coping strategies that the MSME and the SME sector is using in Nigeria and what's working in over there? Thank you, Dr. Goswami. <laughs> um, I, I also read your profile and I know that um, um you 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 are someone i should be looking up to and following and first of all i want to thank the um alliance and also thank the global compact network in um india or the um for for um you know for for inviting me to speak um and um i i think nigeria when nigeria was hit by the um covid 19 um, it was going through its own shocks because of the um, price war in oil um, between Russia and Saudi. So there was a huge drop in the oil price. And it's important to take it from that context because a lot of our GDP as a country is driven by crude oil and uh, our sale of crude. So the, comp the country itself was um, affected and was under shock. Um, the price of oil went down to $28 a barrel from about you know 56, well, $70 a barrel. Um, it stabilized a bit now, but that was Nigeria going into COVID. And as a result, there's been very little that government, well, can do or has been able to do in assisting SMEs who have been hit greatly by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we went into a lockdown and that lockdown meant that key industries, for instance, the agricultural industry, uh, were not able to basically go to the farm. We had borders closed between the different states in Nigeria. And it means that it meant that, that it's meant that there's been a shortage of farm workers. Um, and I think we're going to see a food security issue going into Q3 and Q4 as a result, because the planting season, uh, um, farmers haven't been able to plant um, crops um, on time. And even when they've been able to plant, it's been um, not as much as I, I guess they would have been able to, to in, in previous times. It's affected as SMEs as far as cash flow is concerned. And that's been one area where the government has tried to assist. Um, but um, a lot of um, SMEs have really suffered in this area. There was actually a, um, um, a survey that was done um, and by a, a, an organization called the Fate Foundation in, in partnership with Budget Nigeria. And they discovered, they, they took responses from about 2,000 MSMEs across the 36 states in Nigeria. And an overwhelming 94.3% of businesses surveyed reported that their key issues were in regards to um, cash flow, sales, and revenue. 
um, about 13% of them, only 13% of them had enough cash flow to stay operational for one to three months. But the vast majority of them, about roughly 57, um, 59% of them, had only enough cash flow to stay alive for one to four weeks. So what has been, I mean, the 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 outcome of this, the, the government, I mean, we'll go into that a bit later on, but I think for SMEs are realizing that to be able to survive, they have to innovate, innovate in terms of technology. Um, they have to take a critical look at their cash flows. Um, they have to uh, manage their costs aggressively. And um, a lot of them have had to unfortunately lay off staff um, just to be able to survive. Um, they have to have had to look at their supply chain, but there's some good news in that the bigger companies are realizing that they have to pay the SMEs within their supply chain on time. Um, quite a number of them have taken steps to do so. We are one of those companies who have taken steps to do that. And there's been quite a bit of support from member organizations that um, cater for the SME sector in, in terms of, um, you know, um, training and access and, and giving them information about where they can access finance and how they can restructure um, their businesses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayatollah. I would now move to Thorsten, who is just welcomed morning in Bolivia. And to give you a little profile of Thorsten, just give me a minute here. And I hope I have your pronunciation right. Thorsten Kostchu has been Chief Executive Officer of the German Colombian Chamber of Commerce and Industry since January 2019. Prior to this, he was head of coordination America's Western Europe division of the German Chambers of Commerce and Industry abroad, as well as the foreign trade affairs at the Association of German Chambers of Industry and Commerce in Berlin. Between 2013 and 2017, the fully qualified lawyer who made his MBA from 2010 to 2011 was managing director of the German Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Uruguay. From 2011 to 2013, Mr. Koschu was head of Office of the AHK India in Kolkata, responsible for representation of German economic interest in East and Northeast India. Thorsten has been Chief Executive Officer of the German Columbian Chamber of Commerce and Industry since January. Prior to this, he was Head of Coordination Americas, Western Europe Division of Green Commerce and Industry abroad as well. Thorsten, without kind of waxing lyrical about your profile, because it will put us all to shame, I open the floors to you to talk about the kind of work you have done till date. And specifically, I would say, focus on the MSME and the SME sector and how the part of Latin America, Bolivia, where you at the moment are based, how is it coping with it? And what is the mechanism by which that you can see that how badly that sector has been hit? Well, thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Goldami. Uh, thank you very much for Alliance. Um, for integrity and the global compact India, when India was calling, as you as you heard from Ms. Muslami, I, I lived there a couple of years. I have great memories um, and great friends still there. Uh, when India was calling, I couldn't say no, right? So I'm, it's it's a great pleasure and to be here with such esteemed experts actually is also a big honor for me. Um, I also to put you in the context maybe about um, about the situation of, of COVID right now here we are in a lockdown since mid of March in, in Colombia um, since 1st of June we have a so-called intelligent lockdown which means that the local authorities can decide on the courses of action depending on the severity of the the pandemic in their respective locality for instance here in Bogota we have at this point of time eight neighborhoods which are fully under lockdown no one can can leave those those localities because there's a high number of uh, persons infected with the COVID. And despite the early lockdown, the number of persons infected with COVID has risen during the last months to a number which unfortunately since last week uh, is also above the numbers of Germany and Italy. Um, and we have to say with much less tests, which we have done. Um, I can also say that um, the situation here is, is quite close to Nigeria because a big part of the budget of the government comes from the export of, of oil. And when, and when the, the oil price in the global market 
just sank to up to twenty twenty five dollars a barrel. It was a big hit for the Colombian government, who has for the budget for this year planned with more than sixty five dollars per barrel. So this also limited their uh, finances in order to help the the economy. Um, we have we have nowadays um, an unemployment rate of twenty one point four percent which was in December still at 9.5%. There's a study from World Bank saying that around 15 million jobs in Colombia are affected by the coronavirus, and these are around 40 to 45% of the jobs. This does not mean that 15 million people lost their job, but some had to go to um, vacations, um, and yes, some, some already lost the job. It's, it's a very tough situation, and who suffers most are the, are the SMEs. Um, here in Colombia, just to give you a, a brief overview on that, we have also the so-called MIPIMES. These are the, the MSMEs, um, micro enterprises up to 10 workers, small enterprises between 11 and 50 workers, and medium enterprises between 51 and 200 workers. And in Colombia, there are more than 2.5 million of these uh, MSMEs. These are 99% of all the Colombian companies. They represent 90% of the national productive sector and employ over 80% of the national workforce. So you see, if, if this group of, of companies suffer, the entire company, is, the, the entire country is, is suffering a lot. And yes, the SMEs, they are suffering. Also the same um, as my colleague from Nigeria told, it's the cash flow, pro cash flow problem. Uh, many of them had max cash flow for two months. So what the government is doing, they're giving loans. And yes, this, this helps the companies, but at the same time, at some point of time, they have to pay it back to the government. So we, we need to see how that actually um, evolves in the next couple of years. Also, the, the, the average SME in Colombia um, goes bankrupt after the first year, or 50%, 50 sorry, they go bankrupt after the first year, and 20% only survive the third year. So this is already a very difficult situation which the SMEs are in. And now with the COVID, it's getting, uh, it's getting worse. What, what we have seen is um, also what my colleague from India told. There are new business models for the SMEs. Um, there's there's the, the need for them to innovate. And a lot of them are doing it. And they are ahead of their competitors, those who are not actually innovating. Um, there are also some initiatives from the government. For instance, here in, in the region where in the state where Bogota is also located, the the government of the state they offered to to the farmers that they could directly sell to the consumers because as of now there are a lot of intermediaries uh, but in this in this chain so the farmers they really don't get a lot for the products so what this government said is they set up a platform an online platform where consumers we, i myself also did it can buy products from directly from the farmers and they're being delivered then to your to your place i think that these are innovations they will stay. They will not disappear after COVID. They will stay. So this is a new business model also for, for the farmers. Um, the mom and, and, and dad stores, they were not allowed and still are not allowed in many places to open. So this is another uh, a big problem for those, um, for those stores and for all the employees of, of these stores. Um, there's a discussion if there would be another lockdown maybe here in Colombia. If that would be the case, that would be very tough, very, very tough for the SMEs who have, as of now, survived um, the, the crisis as of now. That would be all for now. Thank you, Thank so much. Uh, I will now um, ask Mr. Vinit Agrawal to give his comments, but before I do that, I'll read out his uh, biography. Mr. Marit Agrawal is Executive Director, Supply Chain Management in Engineers India Limited, New Delhi. A graduate of electrical engineer from REC Rao Kurukshetra, India, joined Engineers India in 1987. He has vast and rich experience of more than three decades in international and domestic commercial domain. His expertise includes the construction management, contracting and purchasing for large industrial projects in oil and gas, vendor development and vendor management, marketing for PMC and engineering consultancies, and services for Indian and international oil and gas projects. Presently, he is leading team responsible for providing complete purchasing and contracting services for all mega projects being handled 
by EIL. He has successfully demonstrated leadership skills and managed day-to-day -day operations under the complex management situations. Mr. Agarwal, given that your background is with a very really large conglomerate like EIL and has a focus on, especially on oil and natural gas as well, when you look at it from your supply chain perspective, how I would particularly ask you this question, how are you dealing with your supply chain, especially the small and medium enterprises and the medium scale enterprises? And what do you think has been the COVID's impact on the viability of the sector? So you're on mute, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you, sir. We can't hear you. Is the microphone working? Can anybody else hear him? Thorson, can you hear me? No, no, know. I can't. No, we can't hear him. No, we can't. Sir, we can't hear you. Seema, are you there on the call? Yes, I'm there. Uh, I'm there and I'll just call him and see what is happening there. But okay. maybe you can continue further yes. and uh, we'll just get back. Yeah. Uh, Ashwini, I'll ask you a question here. Given your international background with IFC and other organizations and having worked on this issue specifically, if one looks at it from a um, bipart non-partisan perspective, what do you think that countries like India, Nigeria, Bolivia, what do they need to innovate on from a governance perspective to give a boost to MSME and SME sector? See, uh, if, uh, uh, because if you look at the core issues that typically SMEs or MSMEs face across any economy, I think I would like to put them into four, four buckets. The first one is the high cost of capital that they have to you know, uh, look at. That's, that's one thing. Banking systems or financial systems have always been more inclined towards large-scale uh, lending rather than the MSME lending. That's one area. The second is, you know, uh, because of this, there are very low opportunity to do innovations or look at research. I think that's another thing which puts them at the uh, back end. The third thing is that they would have, obviously, because of, you know, the lack of capital reasons, uh, they would have comparatively poorer access to raw materials and manpower, skilled manpower, if I may say so. And fourth, which seems to be a big missing uh, gap, I would say a yawning gap, especially you know from the lens of governance that you asked, is that there is there is hardly any uh, collective or I would say a good representative organization which can champion the causes of MSMEs at the policy level, at the policy front. I think these are the four things you know which kind of and I would say it's a vicious cycle of all these four things put together by which, you know, they kind of uh, uh, mutually say, reinforce each other, puts these MSMEs at a uh, challenge. And when it's when we say about access to finance or uh, high cost of capital, it's not just about the MSMEs who are entering, uh, who are already existing. It also creates an impediment for the new startups to come in. I mean, in our country, from India, I can give you an example that the number of startups that have come into, uh, who have tried to look at, try to bring in skilled manpower, because these are all, you know, uh, young graduates from good management institutions, from technical institutions. So they do bring in, you know, the technical expertise. They do have fantastic ideas. They want to innovate. But the fact that there is no ecosystem to provide them that kind of a platform, I think that that becomes a big impediment for them. And I think if we can work on all some of these components, uh, especially uh, under these trying times, I think these innovations, as Thorsten very nicely put up, would be the you know key changes that are going to stay. Uh, the way uh, you know technology is being used as a platform right now, the way you know we are cutting across the boundaries between one value chain partner to the other value chain partner. I think these are the things which are going to stick around. And that would redefine, uh, I would say, the way MSMEs are today ensconced in the economic systems of any country. 
Thorsten, given your background of Europe and of uh, India and then of Latin America, what do you think are the impediments that have become more come more to the fore because of COVID? Well, first of all, um, I think that that um, Mr. Mr. Ashvini is is totally correct with, with what he said. What we what we see here is a lot of is a lack of in certain ways of of um, knowledge about finances, for instance, in in the companies. Um, the lack of of uh, the cash flow and the working capital as well. Um, and we also see that they have little or no knowledge of the digital world. And it is something which we can understand because a lot of them also, they live in the rural areas where we also have to work on the infrastructure. So the infrastructure has to be in place for them to, in order to, to be able to set up maybe their own website, their own shop, uh, online shop, etc. Um, and what I would also like to like to say, and we see that in Germany a lot, that the German SMEs, because Germany lives from the exports, a lot of German SMEs, they do export. Here, the number in, in Colombia is still low. Um, and when they export, they do it more to the neighboring countries like Ecuador, like uh, Peru, Brazil, um, and not so much to maybe to North America or to the or to Europe, where also a big a uh, big market would, would wait for their products. Uh, most of the products which Colombia is exporting is uh, also from agriculture sector, like cafe, like fruits, like vegetables, etc. And there's a there's a good market um, in North America and in Europe for their products. So I think they could uh, work more on the internationalization. This is also something where we, as as a business association, come in in order to in order to help them. Um, as we said, yes, a lot of them are actually right now fighting to survive yeah um this has been the case as i said like 20 percent only survived the third year here in colombia and that was before covid so the situation right now is is even more difficult for them so um they concentrate fully and understand that on on their business and they cannot so much look into innovation or into maybe um doing a workshop on finance or um on on, on other topics which which actually might might help them a lot Artula, the same question to you. Given your experience in Rwanda, Nigeria, and Kenya, what do you think is relevant for MSME and SME sector that is of the most crucial point from actually recovering from COVID and taking them much farther than they were before? You're on mute, Aitola. My apologies. Um, to be honest, um, Thorsten and uh, Mr. Ashwini ha have spoken to uh, some of the some of the key areas. Um, they include, for instance, the um, access to finance. That's always going to be there. Um, paramount. Um, there, there's also that business support um, and mentoring because COVID is a crisis that a lot of nobody has gone through a pandemic like this. I mean, we had Ebola. Um, but we, as a country, we were not really that badly affected. We were able to actually, uh, thanks to one of our doctors, um, um, we were able to tap that. So this is really the first time we're going through a pandemic. And a lot of SMEs have not gone through crisis before. So in terms of risk management and being able to adequately risk manage this crisis, they have um, been... Um, it's been very, very difficult. So one of the areas of need is mentoring. And it's amazing. There's just been a poor proliferation of webinars uh, targeted at SMEs, uh, providing information and training on how to survive this. And, um, you know, when you when you call for a free training, sometimes um, by by a virtual training, um, it's amazing how at the very beginning we would have maybe about 300, then it went up to 600, and now there are webinars that are, you know, going all very close to 10,000, some over 10,000. So there's a definite need for training support, for business support, for mentoring. 
And I think the other thing is access to markets. Before COVID-19 happened, the government, the federal government, another thing that happened in Nigeria was that the federal government had actually closed the border with the Republic of Benin. And there's a lot of trade that goes on between Nigeria and the Republic of Benin, a lot of inflow and outflow in terms of farm workers, in terms of agricultural produce, in terms of cars. Um, and so the, the shutdown, um, the shutting of the border had actually affected a lot of businesses, and then COVID just heightened the 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 the, 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 um, the problem. Um, another key area I mustn't forget is electricity. Um, we have a problem with electricity in Nigeria um, in terms of affordable electricity, alternative sources of energy. That's really key because um, without um, stable electricity. Um, you're not even able to encourage um, enterprise manufacturing and then also the products from manufacturing. Um, we talked about, um, you know, um, internet um, accessibility, and there was a key, a key area where SMEs have asked for government support is regarding policies and regulatory considerations that help um, to enable internet penetration particularly high speed internet access in non urban and city areas and city areas and city segments and then you of course look at the area of tax rebates you know it's one thing and, and again this is where um there is a conflict between what the government requires and what smes require because of the fall in revenue from oil and gas which is the government's key revenue earner um there's a need to raise taxes there's a need to ensure that even um, people operating businesses come out of the informal sector and the informal sector in Nigeria is large and, and, and re register and regularize their position. The whole um, approach of the government in not giving tax rebates or tax holidays during this period um, has meant that a lot of SMEs are now being driven into the informal sector, which causes a reduction in revenue for government. And so it's almost like counterproductive. Um, so, you know, these are some of the key areas that I feel governments need to address, particularly in Nigeria, access to affordable energy, really considering tax rebates, much more than loans, because the loans have to be repaid. In, in Nigeria, we have the government has given um, loans um, with a one year moratorium. After, if, if the SME survives that one year, it, it still has to repay that loan. And, and where is that going to come from? And let's not forget that these are SMEs that contribute 84%. They employ 84% of the workforce in Nigeria and contribute 48% to GDP growth. So, you know, I think a, a strategic approach needs to be taken in ensuring that they are able to survive. Thank you. I will propose a provocative question to both Ayatollah and to Thorsten now, because you come from an oil and natural gas rich economies. We, and I will pick up a thought that Thomas Friedman talked about in his recent book, Thank You for Being Late. And he actually says, and he said it in the previous book as well, that if you look at Middle East, it has done more harm than good to from a gender equity and equitable, um, uh, what do you call it, distribution of resources, because it was an oil and natural gas economy, it had the economic willpower and in the economic might but probably did not have the socioeconomic might and the willpower to actually lead to progress for all. So from a comment from you from a Nigeria perspective and Thorsten, a comment from you from a uh, Colombia perspective. So I can follow, please. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the government realized this and has for, for a number of years, um, the approach has been to diversify the economy. And quite a lot has been done in the agricultural sector. Unfortunately, I must say that one of the reasons why we've not been able to make that much progress is because of corruption. Um, and for instance, there's no point in saying, okay, we're going to make tractors and bulldozers available to clear farmlands. It's so expensive to clear a plot of farmland in Nigeria. Okay, so we get all these international grants and these tractors come in and they're given to the states, um, but the states are charging the farmers astronomical sums of money to be able to lease the bulldozers and to lease the tractors to be able to do the farming. 
Then, of course, you have indigenous issues, you have community issues. So you're given, you know, a reasonable size plot of land. And if you are, and this is to go into industrial agriculture now, industrial farming, because the subsistence farming, the small farm holder um, um, the, the approach does not lead to economic growth in the way that, you know, industrialized farming does. So, of course, you want to encourage the right kind of people to go into agriculture so that you're able to make it a viable alternative to the oil and gas industry. And so we, uh, when, when, when they, you go in, because you're not necessarily from the area where you have been given an allocation of land, uh, and you're told, okay, maybe this is government, government land, government acquired land, or even when you go and you buy the land from the community, you still find that there is, unfortunately, what has developed is an entitlement culture. What's developed is a culture whereby people expect, because of oil revenue, to be give, states expect to be given an allocation. Um, there isn't that degree of um, attention paid to internally generated revenue and internally generated funds, even within the states. And there's this kind of like, um, you know, cascading uh, um, mentality and mindset where people expect to just be given things rather than have to work for things. And that and that is so. So, you know, there's a lot of having to change the mindset and the psyche of people to become viable contributors to the economy. Sustainability will only come when we deal with corruption. It's a big thing. We have, we've had recently over the last two weeks, a major scandal with the Niger Delta Development Corporation. This is an organization that was given funds to improve the welfare of the oil producing states. And we've learned that a huge amount of money has been, um, is unaccounted for. There was an audit that was done and we're talking in the region of over $3 billion unaccounted for. Um, we see politicians um, really prospering in, in quotes um, and living large. And the mindset of the, of the small business owner is why should I pay taxes and contribute to an economy that is all uh, and, and, contrib and contribute when the taxes I pay, I'm not going to see the benefit of those taxes. So yes, oil has been a curse in Nigeria. If that is the, the that that is what Friedman Milton Friedman is talking about, yes, it's been counterproductive. But at the same time, you see other economies who um, who are largely driven by oil revenue, who have been able to get their act together. And I'm talking about the Middle Eastern economies and you we marvel and say, well, why can't we be the same? You know, we're all parts of OPEC, but why can't we turn this blessing that we have in our country into something that just drives growth in all other sectors within this country? We look at even gas. We have so much natural gas that's been fled. That gas can drive the power sector if if infrastructure is put in place, which will then drive the um, economy, drive the SMEs, drive the manufacturing sector, and bring about overall prosperity. But unfortunately, if the right people are not in leadership and the right policies are not in place. Um, and the whole mindset of a whole generation of, of several generations that have grown up within this corrupt system is not changed, then we can't have sustainable growth and it, it's going to be difficult. But we keep trying and hoping against all hope. Thank you. We can hear you, Ms. Gosvami. How does it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. No. Um, well, first of all, Miss Miss Ayotola, really, I um, I feel I feel sad for for your country about what you what you just just mentioned. And oh, fortunately, fortunately, in Colombia we're in a different situation. Uh, yes, we also have this blessing, but it is also very important to know in which the government is investing 
all this money which comes from which comes from oil. Um, we don't even have to look like to to other continents in order to see maybe a, an example of of bad use of of such uh, income. We have Venezuela just at the at next to our place in Venezuela. Um, more than 4 million of the 30 million Venezuelans had to leave the country because of the situation there. And this is, this is the country which is said to have the largest reserves of oil in the world. Uh, more than 95% of the budget of the government comes from oil. Um, of course, now with, these, with the drop of the oil price and with all the sanction, the income has also dropped nearly to, to, uh, to not to zero, but uh, has dropped a lot. Um, if you see that Venezuela had a had last year an inflation of twenty thousand percent, the year before it had more than one million percent. It is very difficult there for any industry to to grow. Here in Colombia, um, the government has quite early already uh, recognized that we need to diversify. We need to diversify because they already see that, for instance, the the interest in or the demand for oil and for, for coal, which is also very important for Colombia, is dropping also because of the use of renewable energies in other parts of the world. So what is the Colombian government doing? They're, <coughs> sorry, they're investing a lot in education. They're investing a lot in uh, tourism, for instance. They say that tourism is our next petrol, yeah, because we will get a lot of foreign tourists and they will pay here in, in dollars or in euros. Um, and another investment is being done in renewable energy. So they also want to get into the, uh, go to the cleaner energy. And there's something which the current president, President Duque, who is now in charge since almost two years, there's something which he lost, which is so-called in Spanish, the, the economia naranja, which is the creative industry. He said, we need to grow in creative industry. If we see that uh, uh, countries like Paris, as uh, like France and Germany, what the 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 percentage the participation of the creative industry in the gdp is we are far below that so he said we need to work on that we need to work on on innovative solutions um and another thing is um infrastructure projects as of now the transport within colombia is very expensive so if you just want to move a container from uh, the southern uh, from the northern port to the to the capital the price is the same as if you ship it from Europe to, to this port. So um, there's a lot of in infrastructure investment going on right now um, in, in tunnels, in, uh, in roads. They want to use the rivers also for transportation. So there's a vision, there's a plan behind all these, these projects. And I think this will really help the entire economy and of course, also the SMEs. And another thing is the um, we have we don't have like problems with energy here, but yes, the infrastructure for internet has to be also uh, improved uh, in the rural areas. Thank you so much, Mr. Agrawal. Can you hear me now? I I don't know whether my voice is done. Yes, it's audible now. Perfect. Okay, good, good, good. good. So I'm going back sorry for that. I'm sorry for the technical glitch. No problems, no problems. Going back to the question I asked you earlier, that what, with your experience having worked, is working at EIL, what has been your experience in dealing with MSME and the SMEs in your supply chain? And what do you think needs to improve in that sector so that the economy can be revived at the soonest? See, as far as the pandemic is concerned, MSME sector has suffered a lot and uh, their production during this COVID-19 has uh, decreased by 90% at one point of time. And this sector, in fact, is uh, around 75 million enterprises are there in India who are uh, MSMEs and they employ around 115 million people. And they contribute 30% of the GDP, uh, of India's GDP. And uh, around 45% uh, exports are being made by MSMEs. With this, we have MSMEs and they are a critical engine for India's economy. But due to COVID-19, a recent survey says around 30 million people have lost their jobs up to June 2020 and around 10 to 15 people 
million people are expected to further lose their job by August 20. Now, to boost economy uh, and revival of MSMEs, government announced various reliefs. The move was to uh, basically to give uh, revival to the small scale industries. But what has happened, the MSMEs, no doubt they are trying to come back to the economy with the support of government, with the uh, non-banking financial companies. And government is also monitoring uh, the implementation of the various schemes which they have recently uh, announced. But what has happened, most of the benefits of these schemes are being taken by the medium enterprises. But small enterprises are not coming forward to avail the government declared benefits. Maybe one could, reason could be there due to the lack of uh, their awareness. Or they are already uh, basically uh, are having uh, so much uh, you know, debt on their uh, accounts. They don't want to have further risk. But on the other end, if we see MSMEs have captured new opportunities very well, like manufacturing of medical accessories, taking sanitizers, PPE kits, hand gloves, masks. And use of these items is going to become permanent in future, even if the corona is eliminated. And this could uh, be uh, <clears throat> good sustainable business for in future. In this difficult situation, MSMEs are becoming international champion and they are extending all the <coughs> support with the help of uh, government schemes. And I hope uh, the, uh, the economy will definitely will come uh, and they will, uh, it will reboot. Thank you so much, Mr. Agrawal. Uh, Mr. Saxena, I have a question for you. If you look at primary sectors, mining, agriculture, fisheries, um, the other agriculture, forestry, agriculture related sectors, they, are, they almost have 35% of the, of the entire economy is dependent upon them. And they actually are the primary sectors because they supply so much into the tertiary sectors as well. What do you think the governments should be doing to revival of primary sectors? And looking at the global supply chains, how do we ensure the sustainability becomes the buzzword post key? Like everybody's talking about the new normal. What will the new normal be for the primary sectors? And how do we ensure that sustainability criteria are met by these sectors who are, who are actually the primary feed in sectors for the other tertiary and secondary sectors as well? that you asked uh, that's a very wonderful question and uh, i would you know i was just echoing um, i was just thinking aloud you know when thorsten was talking about colombia and venezuela and ayatollah was talking about nigeria and having spent considerable time in zimbabwe i was you know just uh, reminiscing the same story there uh, a you know we all know about corruption million percentage of inflation land being given to people after annexation from others so that they could practice farm and i remember you know my driver telling me that first thing that he did on his allotted farm was to go and sell off all the trees that he had there because timber had good price and after that he just came back because he didn't know what to do with that farm so but at the same time you know you have models uh, even in these difficult situations where cash is an issue where you know telephone has been used as a very good cash transfer mechanism so the the success of eco cash in uh, zimbabwe that i've seen when i was there was a wonderful example how you know it it kind of connected the dots and you know the small uh, sellers and small buyers retail buyers how they could be connected by a small simple thing called a mobile phone so i'm sure you know there are uh, ways and means of doing it so in terms of primary sector you know before getting into that I would also, I'm also tempted to, you know, bring in one more element that we seem to be missing out. And that element is that we always keep on believing that small, being small is a problem for the SMEs. 
I think being small is also an advantage for SMEs. And my own, you know, work that I've done with Unido in the cluster development program for so many years in uh, so many locations tells us that it's not the uh, the size which matters; it's the isolation which really is the crux. So nothing stops for the SMEs to you know collaborate, to you know work together, and define the boundaries of their competition at a different level. And so rather than competing amongst themselves, it's about collaborating together, collaborating amongst themselves and competing with others. And therefore, this, this model uh, has, uh, has tested you know, quite well across the country in India. I can give you n number of such examples. They're just being small or medium in size has not mattered. The idea of collaborating and which also brings in the element of how to make various services which are required uh, to make them affordable. So, so for textiles, you know, if you are a SME and you re require good quality designs, you know, hiring a top-notch designer alone would be difficult. Uh, but hiring a top-notch designer and sharing the inputs together uh, and sharing the costs together would make an advantage. In pharma sector, if I can give you the example in the country, uh, when uh, the uh, WHO guidelines became compulsory and WHO compliance became necessary for all MSME pharma companies in the country, I can tell you, they all uh, worked together to bring in uh, consultants who can help them redesign their factories in the most cost-effective manner, and they share the cost of these consultants to you know redefine themselves and get the WHO compliance certificates for them, and which therefore brought in the revolution of generic medicines in our country, and I would say 60 to 70 percent of the rural markets, you know, the rural consumers today are catered to, are catered to by these MSME pharma companies. Coming back to the primary sector that you're saying, I think what has happened is because of the impediments of getting finance, uh, a lot of uh, you know primary sector workers moved into the tertiary sector. And because of which we turned more, rather than a producing uh, country, we turned more into a trading country. And therefore mm -hmm. the factor conditions, you know, uh, so therefore I would not mention the country, but we started importing and we started trading. And I mm -hmm. think that took away the basic resilience of our MSMEs who were capable of producing and who were capable of producing and connecting it to the markets. So that's one part. The second part, I think, which has missed, which has been missed is that we, uh, I mean, I'm talking, uh, please pardon me, Tosin, please pardon me because I'm giving, uh, you know, more from an Indian perspective that, you know, markets were never distant for our producers for the primary sector. Markets were not too far off. Markets were not being so regulated that they were they were supposed to be an APMC and all that. So the regulation came much after, and the regulation came to bring in certain standards to which the uh, small producers were not being able to adhere to. And so therefore, if you look at even farming, for example, the APMC Act itself, which came in the country, you know, to regulate the farming uh, market, actually turned a counterproductive uh, policy uh, instrument. And so today, most states have done away with the APMC Act, which is now opening up, and which creates an opportunity for companies like, you know, who are into IT-enabled uh, uh, market linkages to come up. We are right now working with a number of farmer producer organizations across the country who are directly connected to small, uh, I would say not even small, but I would say micro enterprises who just have a technology platform and who know where to connect the FPOs with. So connecting this FPOs, these FPOs to the markets, to the end consumers, I think that's something, you know, which is uh, coming up very well. And I think if the government can really help uh, and if the MSMEs themselves want to help themselves, I think this is one space where a lot of work can be done. So to connect the primary sector, you know, to the uh, end consumer uh, in, a, in a new way, which is going to be more suited after this COVID pandemic, I think that's another thing. And if you look at... Uh, uh, forestry products, uh, we don't even realize how there is a whole supply chain for forestry products, uh, you know, which, which reach to our homes, which reach on our plates, uh, without we realizing that there is a whole chain of, you know, people uh, engaged in the primary sector. Uh, and therefore, a lot of government initiative, or I would say even development initiative, which happened, was around thinking that we have to cut off these middlemen. So by trying to minimize the middlemen, what has happened is that a, a lot of unemployment was created in these value chains also. The supply chains got disrupted. 
and since we did not have another equally robust mechanism therefore you know the primary sector took a back seat and uh, if i may say primary and secondary uh, because for india if, if i may give the example after agriculture the second most important occupation is handlooms and which also has a very important gender dimension to it because largely it's women oriented now what are the key issues it's a secondary uh, sector providing primary employment to almost 65% of the rural workforce but their inputs are also dependent upon not msmes but their inputs are dependent upon some large scale industries so therefore you need to have a hank yarn obligation for the textile mills to continue to produce hank yarn so that the handlooms can survive and you're talking about billions of handloom weavers working across the entire country and if we go into the details of these small decentralized producers whether they are into agro processing whether they are into handicrafts whether they are into handlooms or for that matter any other small uh, own account enterprise uh, they are at a disadvantage because their control on the uh, resources that they require to even produce are quite limited so i think that's where uh, coming together collaborating uh, i think that's one way which they can do themselves and the second is you know either through some representative bodies or through direct interventions by the government and development this gap has to be bridged one positive ray of hope that i see is that thanks to the digitalization which is catching up very big way the connect to the markets is improving so yes. right now we are working with a bunch of you know women uh, producers sitting in a very remote location somewhere in the kinor valley of himachal but they are now being able to you know sell their products in the on the, on platforms like amazon so i think that that kind of a connect can be certainly created and it only requires not significant amounts of investment but just thinking through the entire supply chain uh, uh and then uh, specifically for covid uh, in india i think there, there's another good initiative that we have picked up uh, which is about linking people to the msme finance which is right now available through government of india uh almost i think about 100 lakh crores is what government has uh, you know kind of committed of that about 82000 crores has already been taken up but yet again people are being linked so there uh, thorsten we've come up with a technology platform which connects people through an app based you know service that what they can avail of from the government from different institutions and just to make that match making and that match making itself creates livelihood opportunities employment opportunities for volunteers from the community to work on that so i think there are lots of innovations available all across we'll just have to go and connect with them yeah. i related to what you said and thank you for saying those very very important words of wisdom and i'm going to kind of uh, broaden the scope of the discussion here and going to say because i just read today morning that is in 19 still 1974 If a woman headed enterprise wanted to apply for loan, even in the U.S. of A, she had to have a man as a co-signatory. <laughs> the country we all think is the most progressive of all. We like to assume that. Even till 1974, that was the reality, which is just 45 years ago. So, from that perspective, from a gender perspective and other perspectives, I throw a question to you: Do you think COVID has made Life easier or more difficult for women-headed businesses. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. In, in I can answer generally, and and say that the. Okay, so let let me start by talking about the CBN um, re, um relief that was given to SMEs initially when it was put together. Um, the people who were um applying for those loans had to show they had they needed collateral and of course a, a lot of smes msmes don't have that fortunately uh, there was a rethink and um certainly for that funding you do not need collateral and women have been able to take uh, to take um, advantage of that particular uh funding again the funding that's been available to SMEs SMEs has has been capped initially was as much as 25 million naira um but in reality they're only getting 2.5 million which is about 10% of that that's the highest amount that has been given out so if you do need more than that 2.5 million 
uh, for your cash flow needs, um, you know, to be able to continue in business. Unfortunately, that's not going to be made available. Um, I, I have friends who run SMEs and I was having a conversation with one of my friends. We go walk in every morning and she happened to mention that she needed to um, get in touch with her ex-husband in re respect of a loan that um, she was uh, that he had previously guaranteed for her. There is still that um, th there is still that aspect of if you then want to go for any other loan and it involves collateral and you're a married woman, then you are going to need your husband's permission. So unfortunately, things have not um, progressed in that respect with traditional loans. There are um, there are there are there are measures in place, and there there is funding that is available primarily to women businesses. Um, and so yes, things have improved over time. And like I said, COVID has opened up the market, but it's not been specifically targeted at at female entrepreneurs. Um, the other aspect um, I want to talk about, because I do also know businesses that are run by women. Women have then therefore learned to become a lot more um, ingenious and innovative in how they grow their businesses because of this constraint. And so I think that sometimes there is that aspect where um, what is a challenge because of the spirit of the people and because of the resilience of women then becomes gets turned into an opportunity. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I really like what um, um, the last speaker spoke about when he talks about partnering. You know, SDG 6, 17 is about partnering for the goals. And, and the most important thing, um, I remember coming into this year and speaking to some friends and people that I mentor and saying to them, this is a year where we're going to have to partner. And this was way before COVID, where we're going to have to partner to scale. Um, again, I don't know if, whether India is the same as Nigeria, but in Nigeria, people would rather own 100% of a, two million naira business than five percent of a 200 million naira business or a 200 million naira business um you know that has to change that mindset has to change and i think that that mindset is changing this is something that covid has done and we find that there are a lot of um initiatives where women are coming together to encourage each other in business. Um, we have WIMBIS, which is women in um, yes. management business in Nigeria, and they have been providing quite a lot of support to um, SMEs, particularly at this time, in helping them to just navigate all the issues regarding cash flow, regarding access to technology, um, so I think definitely things have improved. A lot more can be done, um, and a lot more can be done from the from the government sector. But I actually like the approach of the last speaker because he started off talking about private sector. What can the SMEs do for themselves? And partnering is key. And then what can the private sector do? You know, one of the things that I have been challenging my company to do is to look through our supply chain and make sure that we set a target. It can be just 10% of all our supply chain will be female-owned businesses. And I think if the private sector can come together and encourage that within our larger PLCs, uh, public limited companies and larger limited um, companies, and also if government can set that as a target, even for their MDAs, then I think they, then they are talking. Then they are really supporting female-owned businesses. We still have a situation, unfortunately, where you know, and, and it's very clear where um, women are still marginalised. Um, whether it's in relation to government appointments, or we don't have one single female governor in the whole of the country whether it's in relation to politics. And, you know, the, the other thing I must say is that if women are not in the planning stage 
of how do we manage this crisis, then of course they're going to be marginalized. Um, I remember in the, U in the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson being challenged that in the team, the ministerial team, the COVID <laughs> crisis team, there wasn't one single woman in that crisis team. Um, you know, women have to be involved in resolving issues um, like this because, you know, they make up a very large percentage of the population, you know, and so I think more attention needs to be given. Um, more affirmative action needs to be given. It has to be intentional and deliberate. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that because women are more than qualified to hold these positions and more than competent to run businesses profitably if the environment, if there's an enabling environment to, to, to enable them to do so. Thank you. Thank you. My question to you, in Latin America, if one has to choose to make it gender equitable businesses or put gender in the mix of MSME and the SME debate, what would be your top two recommendations? Also, uh, <laughs> a tough one. Um, well, first of all, Briefly talking about what uh, Mr. Aswani, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ayatollah spoke about, uh, collaborating is, is key and we are working currently on, an, on a project with a village here close to Bogota. So this entire village is coming together to grow one special fruit and then to finally uh, export it. And what are we doing? We are helping with uh, German expertise. There's a program which is also available in India and also in Nigeria, which is called the Senior Expert Program. As a senior expert service. This, these, are, um, these are experts who are now retired, but who are willing to offer their experience without receiving any salary to be it to organizations, be it to companies, um, etc. And we are working with one expert and this village together so that this village can learn from his experience and then finally as a whole export the the products and then hopefully also to germany so i think it's collaborating it doesn't it doesn't make sense that, uh, that the smes or msmes are uh, are competing um, among each other this this won't help anyone um maybe information was from Ms. ayotola in in colombia the government um guaranteed for 90 percent of the loans for the sm msmes so the msmes who were then finally asking the bank for a loan the government said, I will guarantee for 90%. But what is the outcome? The banks are still not giving the credits because of the 10%. So this is another issue which, which still the companies face here. So the government really is, is, is doing an effort, but unfortunately the banks quite often don't give the loans to the, um, to the companies. Um, in terms of the, the, the gender and gender issue here in Colombia, um, the vice president of Colombia is a woman. The Lord Mayor of Bogota, the capital, the capital of, of Colombia, is a woman. And this is a very Catholic country. But, but uh, Claudia Lopez, which is the name of, of our mayor, she's openly, for instance, also homosexual. Yeah? And she won. So the, the majority of the people of Bogota gave her the vote. Um, so I think that the, the gender discussion here is, is more advanced than, than in other countries. And I'm, I'm, I fully agree with uh, Ms. Ms. Ayodola, it's, it's crucial, it's crucial to have women uh, on board in order to, to plan uh, also now the, the re re recuperation of the industry. Um, I think in, in all kinds of discussions, the women have to be, have to be, have to be part of it. And this is what's happening here. If we talk about education, our Minister of Education, she's also female. Um, our Minister of Transport, uh, responsible for infrastructure, is also female. You know, we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, women in 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 this in positions where they can really make a change. And I think this is something which is crucial. And maybe we can take this even as an example, be it for Nigeria or also for other countries, because it works very well. Um, so I think yes, it coming from Europe. We don't even have this big discussion anymore. It, it doesn't matter if it's a man or if it's a woman. Um, it depends really about how is he or she doing the job. 
how is he or she being qualified for the job? I think this should be in the center of the discussion because if we don't consider this, we are back on corruption. So then someone is maybe con um, uh, giving a contract or um, a labor contract to his cousin, not because he, he is more qualified, only because of his family. And if we just concentrate on the qualification, this enables also the women to be more present in, 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 in important decisions. And it yeah, will help in the fight against the corruption also. And maybe speaking briefly about the, the global supply chain, um, for the, the, the Colombian companies, it's very important also to export. And so the, the framework has to be in place for that, um, be it the local one, but also international agreements. And uh, the, the government of Colombia, since many years, they have um, signed 16 free trade agreements with companies and uh, with countries like the US, uh, with the bloc, uh, with Brazil, uh, in order to give a better and privileged access for their products to those um, to the um, to those countries, and this is something which is working also fairly well for for the companies and also is benefiting the the MSMEs. That would be all for now. Thank you so much, Austin. Mr. Agarwal, one question for you because you are coming from a large conglomerate. My question to you is: What kind of help do SMEs and MSMEs need at this point of time? Which is a what are the two top things that you would say that they need to kind of uh, make cope with the pandemic or effects of the pandemic? Looking into the uh, problems of the uh, small scale industries, uh, government has already uh, given a preference that for all government orders, twenty five percent procurement need to be done from the MSMEs. And out of 25%, 3% has been reserved for the women, and 4% has been uh, kept for SCST. But what is happening in India, if we take the engineering goods, we don't find people from these two, uh, neither from women nor from SCSTs, that whatever the target has been fixed by the government. To, for all public sector undertakings to place an order up to the percentages which have been fixed. We don't find any MSMEs. So we're trying to uh, bring all these uh, women, SCSTs, or MSMEs to come out and, uh, you know, to uh, build, to produce, so that they can also come up and they also uh, grow along with the uh, other sectors. This is the uh, one. Then the second, recently in the uh, COVID-19, to give a level playing field for uh, making India, government has fixed that up to 200 crore orders. No international bidding can be done. So we have to do go necessarily for the domestic bidding. Although this type of barriers are available in other countries in, in direct or indirect tariff ways, but in India it has started very recently. So we are trying to give boost to make in India and try to give boost to MSMEs by giving them various uh, benefits so that they also come forward and produce. And because this is a sector which is giving large employment in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Agrawal. I would make one statement here and then I will post my last question to Mr. Saxena because then we will open up for questions. Seema, do we have questions that have come up on the board? Yes, we already have uh, quite a few questions. Yeah. So one last question to you, Mr. Uh, Saxena, before I make my statement. My statement is that if you look at primary sector and primary producers of which more than 65% are women, then we will also need to look at the sustainability challenges we have when we are procuring and we have a global supply chain. Look at palm oil, look at spices, look at coffee, look at tea. More women are involved in these sectors than men are. And we need to put in sustainability standards, not just pesticides and insecticides, 
but how are they produced? Are fair labor standards uh, followed when they are being produced? Are core labor standards being followed when they are being produced? On that question, my question to you, Mr. Saxena is, with this as a background, how do you think you can encourage economic vibrancy at the bottom of the pyramid, especially for primary sectors? What kind of skilling or training is required? That's a that's a bomb of a question, uh, Ms. Goswami. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me to speak about that, but certainly I'll try my best to do that. Uh, you see, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's important for us to remember that at least from the South Asian context, the entire microfinance movement and the way MFIs today have turned into banks, Bandhan is an example, AU is an example, uh, you know, FTFC itself is an example. I mean, you know, the growth is phenomenal. So it has all been dependent upon those small thrift and credit groups managed by women, organized by women. And I think therefore, uh, in terms of their uh, financial acumen in terms of their ability to manage resources, I think there are no questions and there are no doubts about that. And uh, luckily, we as a as a country have been very fortunate to have that women leadership uh, since times immemorial. I would say. Coming to your question, I would say you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of labor, the way we define it, and the labor conditions, the way we define them, I think we'll have to understand the local template in which you know we are we are operating. So so if we look at uh, the manner in which uh, you know production is being done in the rural areas, uh, the manner in which, you know, logistics is being taken care of. I think we cannot have a standardized global template of labor standards. I may be a little provocative when I say so. Uh, but uh, keeping in mind the international standards of safety and security and ensuring the education of children and all those, you know, child labor and all those elements, I think it's important for us to keep all those ILO guidelines in our minds. But at the same time, I think the way labor working conditions would be uh, panning out in, say, Nigeria, vis-a-vis, -vis, say, in Europe, vis-a-vis -vis in India, they would be very different. And so, therefore, we'll have to look at into a, a more detailed analysis of what kind of labor conditions are we talking of, how are they impacting the productivity of that particular enterprise, how it is affecting the uh, the social aspects of the people who are into that enterprise, whether it's the uh, the owner himself or herself, or whether it's the workers working there. And then from that, we'll have to then define how to create an option. I um, can't hear you. Hi, Ashwini, we can't hear you. Ashwini, are you still there with us on the call? It's there. I don't know whether why I'm not being audible. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible now. Okay. Something to, to do with the network. I'm so sorry. So what I was saying is that, you know, uh, I'll just give you an example from one of our own work areas. Uh, a set of women uh, working with uh, mango processing as an activity were at a scale of 300,000 rupees per year kind of an uh, production. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ashwini, uh, maybe it helps that you switch off your camera. I think it takes a lot of bandwidth from you. This year, do that, please. Yeah, I think this is better. Yeah. Uh, let me also try. I don't know why this network suddenly is. Am I audible now? Yes, loud and clear. Perfect. So, so an example from uh, 3,000 rupees worth of annual turnover just by giving them the right linkages and a small amount of hand holding at this moment uh, this year their turnover has moved on to about uh, 6.5 million from 300,000 to 6.5 million yeah. and this is this is the resilience that I'm talking about of MSMEs and thinking of a very small own, uh, own account enterprise, the way we define them in our, uh, you know, SSI uh, guidelines. So, so I think the labor conditions, uh, the manner in which they produce, those standards certainly have to be met. 
but contextualization of those standards is very very important and uh, to answer uh, you know what question mr agarwal was posing you know uh, when the government puts certain kind of guidelines that you know x percentage of reservation done for women or msmes or you know the the, the people from so called backward classes it's like you know not teaching abcd to your child and expecting him to straight away start you know speaking in fluent english or whatever language you want so you can't do that we'll have to start from certain very basic things then only we can have women enterprises then only we can have people from backward communities uh, you know coming up rising up to the levels where they can you know become leaders to uh, big organizations uh, you know or big corporates and i think uh, that's that's something which needs to be worked upon very significantly i would add one thing here and then we can open up for question question and answers is that uh, international agreements international organizations like the institute of sustainable trade the better cotton initiative the coffee initiative the tea sourcing partnerships these are very important to kind of bring cross learning south south learning and also seeing and ab being able to access the markets in the north and in the south as well so these kind of collaborations cross learning cross pollinations ability to learn from each other ability to kind of follow standards and meet them and uh, access the market is very important from a perspective of msme and sme sectors having said that see my questions please <clears throat> yes so the first question is how can healthy competition help smes what and what are the policies that might help smes to become better and resilient okay seema one thing if when you are reading out the question you can also mention who is the question aimed at or then i will as i will assign to someone to answer the question uh, so these questions aren't aimed at a particular panelist they are open questions so uh, anyone who would want to pick up the question sir agarwal would you want to answer that because you would on a daily basis be evaluating proposals from different smes for the same product or a service seema can you uh, repeat the question sure uh, the question is how can healthy competition help smes and what are the policies that might help smes to become better and resilient as far as the government is concerned government has already given the guidelines to all uh, government departments how to deal with the public procurement in uh, dealing with the msmes so now as far as government procurement is concerned no department can deviate from the policies which have been written policies given by the government so everyone has to follow that now if msmes has their own uh, observations with respect to the policies made by the uh, government like like uh, in the covid 19 when the <clears throat> uh, there was a doubt whether the loans which is being given to the uh, msmes whether they are collateral free or not so subsequently government has given the clarification and the banks have started uh, giving the loan without going into much due diligence earlier otherwise the uh, banks were carrying out the complete due diligence and they were restricting the uh, sanctioning of the loan wherever the uh, they come across the uh, incompleteness of their documentation but now since the government has given the uh, that uh, this is a sovereign guarantee given by the uh, government they they are sanctioning the law so these are the factors which need to be taken care uh, by uh, by the smsc uh, messaging so that they they have to come forward of their of their own now secondly in the recent uh, the government has given another uh, platform government e marketplace where the government is trying and giving directions to all uh, government sector that whatever the items are available on government e marketplace everyone is supposed to purchase from that so these are the facilities which are being created and gem platform is being announced on a daily basis and they are trying to include more and more items so that everybody uh, everybody gets 
uh, opportunity to sell their products from gem platform secondly the uh, government has also uh, introduced that in case there are delays in the payments of the msmes they will get interest this facility these facilities were not there earlier but now all these facilities have been introduced by the uh, recent uh, guidelines by the government thank you thank you moving to the next question yes. what aspect uh, what aspects of digitalization affect smes negatively and what are the positive and facilitating aspects of digitalization uh, mr saxena would you want to uh, take the question uh, sure i'll try my best uh, i think any digitalization which is going to create a connect with markets is always going to work for the smes any digitalization which is going to create more opportunities in terms of having more choices for procurement i think it's always going to create opportunities even digitalization in the production uh, process if it takes away the human error i think that also is going to be useful uh, smes have typically faced in my experience uh, not demand constraints but they have typically faced supply constraints they have not been i have seen in my career so far n number of examples where the smes even put together as a group have not been able to meet out an order that has been pushed uh, uh, brought for them because they are not able to you know uh, do standardization and they are not able to produce in those sufficient numbers to reach out to those markets so i think any digitalization which takes away human error any digitalization which connects better to the markets anything which leads to better technology brings down the cost of production i think those would always be useful for smes yeah i told you if i may if i may ask, I say something uh, regarding this um there's one there's one quote which i like a lot which is from klaus schwab the founder uh, of the world economic forum and he said in the new world it is not the big fish which eats the small fish it is the fast fish which is the it's the slow, slow fish and i think this is uh, this is absolutely true and this means digitalization is a huge opportunity but only for those who embrace it i think those who don't embrace it uh, embrace it they will have um, big problems in in the future yeah i tell you want to address the question as well yes i mean i think definitely that's the case digitalization is key um, digitalization will also bring about innovation. You know, one of the questions about healthy competition is really that, um, you know, it forces innovation. It forces you to differentiate from your competitor. And we've seen um, that digitalization is certainly the way to go because, you know, there is what we call the new normal and uh, everything is being done very differently. And the only the smart SMEs are going to survive this. Um, we also see this digitalization in terms of the supply chain, logistics. Um, th there are certain sectors that will do well and have done well out of this COVID crisis. Um, apart from the healthcare sector, there's also the logistics sector, but it's also the ability to, 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 to digitalize um, as an SME gives you access to your consumers or, 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 um, or your customers um, but also digitalization is key in being able to get your product to your customers um, as well. So th that really certainly is the way to go. The other thing I would add for digitalization is not only just the access to customers, it also reduces your cost of doing business. Yeah. Yeah. Asima, we have last three minutes for any burning questions. Okay. Um, so the next question is, how can the entry barriers be eliminated for SMEs, given the complex processes of banks and absence of proper guidance in documentation requirements? How are governments simplifying the processes both in India and in other countries? So this is a question for uh, Austin and Ayatollah. Yeah, in terms of Nigeria, we've got the ease of doing business, um, um, which is actually a global initiative. Um, but one of the things that um, has been, it's historically been very difficult to um, set up and formalize your business and the ease of doing business and various government um, 
um, not just policies, but um, I would say directives, um, particularly regarding the ease of getting licenses to operate your businesses, whether it's licenses from the National uh, um, Food and Drugs Agency or, or, or just, first of all, even getting your incorporation documents out and being able to incorporate very, very quickly. Uh, this initiative has certainly helped um, the business community and particularly SMEs from formalizing themselves, going to the market. I, I think we talk about finance being, um, you know, uh, an important hurdle, but, but you know, I think SM, MSME starts small, um, and then we've got also obviously the microfinance banks who've also been very supportive of SMEs and MSMEs um, and, and been able to ad actually extend not just facilities, but also extend um, advice and consultancy. And we've got some success cases, very good cases. Um, we've got the, also the interventions from the Bank of, Indus, um, Bank of Industry, Bank of Agriculture, the Nigerian Import Export Import Bank as well. And these specialist banks, uh, development banks have been able to come in and, and focus on certain sectors and help drive growth in those sectors. So I think quite a bit has been done. I mean, I must say, I, I, I hope I didn't put, paint such a bleak picture of, of what is happening, because let's not forget that SM, um, SMEs and MSMEs contribute 48% of GDP in terms of Nigeria. That wasn't always the case. There was a time where oil um, was as much as 98% of GDP. Uh, and so there has been some movement in that area. You also have the technology sector. We have in Nigeria quite a lot of um, startups. Um, we have quite a lot of tech startups, um, technology startups with new products that have really um, been able to come into the market and you know, innovate uh, traditional ways of doing things and grow. Um, you know, we we also have, um, and there's been a, quite a lot of targeted investment in those areas as well. Um, I, I think with more um, with more um, internet penetration, with more policy um, around um, you know the the, um, the the development and the and the growth of communications and telecom telecommunications in particular, um, we will see you know quite a lot of uh, development in that in in the SME sector. Uh, let's not forget that we have a huge population in Nigeria. Uh, and that's a huge market. And they are trading and doing business every day. Um, Nigerians are very entrepreneurial people. You know, I think all we need to do is be able to is, is just being able to give them the tools that they need um, and more tools that they need to be able to innovate in that way. In the agricultural sector, what's really useful is that we have um, a number of um, initiatives uh, that have been developed whereby um, um, the various companies are coming to, together to help farmers get their products to market using all kinds of measures in terms of uh, blockchain technology as well um, is being used to to enable in the in the agricultural sector to enable um, to to enable farmers, for instance, get a lot more information to to increase their yield um, and to um, also be being able to access uh, access markets as well. So there's quite a lot of um, good things happening. Um, there, there's an, uh, an organization called uh, Cellulant AgriCore, which has developed a platform that that links the entire food supply chain just using blockchain technologies, connecting farmers directly to consumers on a, on a particular platform with with well over and they have over 15 million registered partners and over a million active partners. So again, uh, innovations like this, technological innovations like this, creating markets for, that, that create markets for um, budding SMEs in crop and livestock production um, uh, and linking them to, to large scale producers, um, you know, it, it is the way to go. Um, that's in the agricultural sector. We have similar things in the fashion in the fashion sector as well um, happening, in, you know, and, and, and in other sectors. So um, a lot of positive um, in, initiatives. Um, you know, what, one last thing I would say, even in, in terms of the palliatives, getting um, food to the um, 
to the people who really need it, the beneficiaries. There, there's something um, the employees within my company did was we came together, we set up an aggregator platform, which we used to link donors to communities that most needed the help using local implementing partners. You know, these are the, the type of uh, social enterprises and tech, um, that leverage on technology to just make things a lot easier and, and make the journey um, from um, producer or from um, um, creator to user a lot, a lot shorter. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Given that we are all five, four minutes past our requisite time, thank you, Thorsten. Thank you, Mr. Saxena. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal. And th thank you, Ayatollah, for a very informative and a vibrant panel. And hopefully, we'll meet someday in person as well. Thank you all. Looking thank forward you, to Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. That's thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It was thank a you, everyone. Thank you. Okay.